Hey everyone, welcome to this webinar about organizing an organization. My name is Molly and I love nonprofit organizations. Uh, I am a coach for women who work in the nonprofit sector. I work full time in the nonprofit sector. I'm a board member in a nonprofit. I teach about nonprofit work as a professor. So I do care a lot about organizations and I hope that we don't only get the chance to consider your organization and the organization you may work for, but also how do you organize yourself? How do you balance all of this stuff coming at you all the time to make your organization more successful? So we'll talk about that a little bit later. One big announcement for you all who are able to join me. On September 28th of this year, my first book will be released. Yay! Uh, so you can find that and pre-order it on Amazon. It's called Hopelessly Hopeful During Separation. And it's a 28-day devotional for people who have just uh, separated from their spouse due to some kind of marital strife. It doesn't point them in the direction of reconciliation or divorce. It just is a place for people to say, this sucks and I need a little bit of hope. Uh, so you can, again, can find that on Amazon. You can also follow me on Facebook, Hopelessly Hopeful Books. And uh, keep, in, keep in tune and in line for all the fun things happening around the book launch. Uh, and also what kind of other books are coming out in the series, because there is a series. All right, but we're not here to talk about me and my book. We're here to talk about you and how to get organized. So let's get started on that. Now, I'm really happy that you've been able to join me here today and to take the first step in becoming organized, whether you're organizing your full organization or just yourself. I am a big fan of productivity hacks, anything to become more efficient and effective. And quite frankly, organization has been the way that that has happened. Uh, so that has been a key in the process and I'd love to share a few more keys with you throughout our time together. Uh, so we'll discuss some simple strategies that you can use just to kind of hit that refresh button uh, on your organization, yourself, so that you can move forward to and be more productive, efficient, and effective. Now, really what this means is taking the time to revisit and perhaps refine uh, certain aspects of your workplace culture, your physical environment, so that you are always operating at top capacity. Now, you can take any one of these principles and apply them to your personal life as well. So let's just stop and pause and take a look around you right now. Uh, what kind of environment are you sitting in? Does it help you in what you're trying to achieve? Uh, let's think about quite literally our cell phones, right? Distraction-free zone. Do you need to turn this off for the next hour, next 45 minutes or so? Uh, you know, it's just as simple as making sure that paper and pen are handy so that when you have an idea and it sparks in your mind, you can just write it down out of your head on your brain. So, um, you know, or maybe like the power cord is too short. And so now you're sitting and you're like leaning to one side and it's just not comfortable. Like we can just organize our space so that you can relax and enjoy. And I hope that that's what you'll be doing tonight. So the first thing we need to talk about is mission statements. So can you tell me what your organization's mission statement is off the top of your head? Or, you know, at least paraphrase it, that would be a good start. But what about your own personal mission statement? Can we even from here paraphrase that? You know, a lot of the people I work with have no idea what their organization's mission statement is or if they even have one. So you may not be alone in that. It's because organizations, quite frankly, usually create a mission statement, stick it up on the shelf, and then let it collect some dust. Yeah, just because it's something you're supposed to do, right? So let's not be that organization. If you're in an organization, make sure to locate your mission statement. Update it if you can. Make sure that it fits your current goals and accomplishments, that you're aiming towards something. And, you know, quite frankly, same goes for your personal life too. My statement is to help others experience significance so that they can have influence. And this drives every decision I make, which organizations I volunteer for, which ones am I on the board for, which ones do I work for, which books do I pick up to read. All of those books line up with my mission statement, help others experience significance so that they can have influence. Now, if you want to dive a little deeper into the topic of mission and values for yourself personally, 
there's two webinars that you can look at. Uh, they're from the series earlier this year. And so all you need to do is go to YouTube and search Nonprofits on a Mission, Molly Bond. You'll find them there. There's a series of uh, six and the first two are the ones that you're gonna to wanna to look at. Now your organization culture should relate to your vision statement, but it also takes a reflection of your employees, organization values, initiatives that you take seriously within the workplace. So what is that culture? Now culture is, this is how things should get to happen. Like this is how they really should get done, right? And we all know what is expected and anticipated. Now there is also climate and climate is, this is how it gets done. This is how things actually happen. And so what we want to do when we're thinking about our culture is to make sure that we're not just reflecting on the climate, but also thinking about the culture. How should things actually happen? When reorganizing the larger umbrella aspects of your organization like culture, you need to take a look at your organization culture, get a read on it. What are your employees saying about it? What's their perception? Now, of course, depending on the size of your organization, you could hold a meeting, send out a survey, ask people to contribute their thoughts, maybe even anonymously. Uh, depending upon what they determine and how they help partner with you in that process, it can help you gain better insight into the positive and the negative elements within your organization that could be highlighted or addressed. The climate piece, right? But we can pull that into our culture conversation. Now, on a personal note, what norms do you have? Think about your habits, the routines. I learned recently about habits that there are three parts. There is the cue, the action, and then the reward. So what kind of cues do you have? What kind of things trigger you to do things automatically without thinking about it? For example, uh, one of my cues is I sit down at my desk in the morning and what's the first thing I do? Open email. Sitting at the computer is my cue to open up my email. So what kind of action would you like to change? Well, if opening your email is not something you wanna do, maybe you start your day a little differently. Maybe a quick five minute meditation, or um, perhaps you don't open your email, or you make your browser to open up a different page, say like your company's intranet page or something else that would be really significant for you to be working on and not let it open up your email first if you are using an internet browser for your email system. There's plenty of ways to change that action. The queue is still gonna be the same, but maybe we can change up the action a little bit. Now that third part, the reward, uh, is something that you can also consider changing. When I see my email and I'm able to respond and clear that off my desk or give an answer to somebody who is really looking for a little bit of help, like. I get a positive experience from that. I get rewarded for it, uh, which is why I spend so much time in my email inbox. So perhaps it's the reward that should change. Maybe I really do need to look at my email as soon as I sit down at my desk, but maybe the reward can be a little bit different for doing a different type of action. So there are ways to consider the cue, the action, and the reward uh, that may come. As you're thinking about your culture, Think about your habits, your personal habits. What are the norms? What are the culture of your life? Now, whether you're the CEO of an organization or perhaps in an entry level position, like most of us, probably the space in between, right? Your job is, as a part of the team is to keep yourself and the people around you motivated to do their best. Now, think about how motivated you are personally in the role that you have now. What changes could be made for to improve your own personal motivation? If you have the power to do so, you can implement two new methods to keep your employees in high spirits and motivated to serve the organization and stay present throughout their workday. How would you respond if somebody said, I really need help motivating my employees around me? Because that may be the thing that is actually motivating you too. Now, you can also look into some industrial and organization uh, psychology research. It's also called IO research. Um, you can take a peek into that and maybe get some more additional ideas. Um, so in the end, by keeping yourself and your team motivated, you or they will deliver better work, your organization will run more smoothly, and you'll be more organized. A great organization is an organized organization. How about that? Now, regardless of what kind of nonprofit you're in, your customer, your client should be top priority. 
So when was the last time you checked in with your client to get a reading on how your nonprofit is perceived? Maybe a board member, maybe a volunteer. Maybe you need to look up your organization on GuideStar. Google yourself. Maybe ask for analytics for somebody or a different kind of organization uh, that is a, a charity watchdog. Now, to keep your organization moving in the right direction, it's important to gain better understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of your nonprofit from the client's or customer's perspective. On a personal level, you could always ask your friends, what's the top five words that you would use to describe me? And sooner or later, once you get past person like four or five in my experience, you start to notice a trend and you start to notice the same words come up. One for me is encouragement, another one is thoughtfulness, and those were actually quite a surprise for me. Those were things that I didn't think were in me, but those around me did see. It was really useful for me to help understand and organize uh, how people are perceiving me and what I can do better in order to serve them better too. Now, speaking of strengths and weaknesses, when was the last time you sat down to create a SWOT analysis? It's an oldie but a goodie. And this exercise is easy to evaluate when you're seen as an organization so that you can choose which direction to go in next. For those of you who aren't sure, SWOT analysis is an acronym for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You basically list them out the same way you would a pros and con list. Uh, for strengths and weaknesses, I tend to think more internally either to um, who I am as a person or the organization. And when I start to think about opportunities and threats, I start to think more externally, either outside of myself or outside of the organization. And that seems to be a really useful tool when I'm thinking about what's my next step, how's the culture, what do I need to organize and prioritize. Now, once you've created that SWOT analysis, get together with your teammates, a few friends and family, and think about some goals. I mean, you can pitch these around without saying, I need to talk to you about my goals. Uh, one way to think about your goals is to put them into a SMART acronym. Now, SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time-Based. Creating broad goals can be a very lofty challenge, uh, and most of the time, let's be real, it ends up going nowhere. It's like that mission statement on the shelf. Now, creating a SMART goal ensures that you have enough specificity to create a game plan in order to reach that goal. So let's take a look at an example. Here's the broad goal. I want to grow my nonprofit. That sounds awesome. That is not a smart goal. So let's break it down a little bit more. Specifically, I will acquire three new donors for my new nonprofit. Measurable. I will measure my progress by how many new donors I bring in while maintaining my current donor database. That's important. Attainable. I will ask current donors for referrals, launch a social media marketing campaign, and network with local businesses. I think that's good. Relevant. Adding additional donors to my nonprofit will allow me to grow my nonprofit and increase my revenue. Uh, Time-based. I will have three new donors within the next quarter. So the SMART goal really plays out as I will acquire three new donors for my nonprofit within the next quarter by asking referrals, launching a social media marketing campaign, and networking with local businesses. This will allow me to grow my nonprofit and increase my revenue. That is much different than I want to grow my nonprofit. Now let's take another look at a more um, personal example. Here's the broad goal, right? One that we can all correlate with after the pandemic. I want to lose weights. So specifically, I will lose 15 pounds in 15 weeks. Measurable. I will measure my progress by how many calories I eat and how many minutes I spend working out. Attainable. I will download a calorie tracking app, join a runner's group, and sign up for a 5K. Relevant. Losing weight will help me feel better, look better, and live a longer and happier life. Time-based. I will lose one pound per week for the next 15 weeks and then maintain that weight and new habits. So the SMART goal reads like this. I will lose 15 pounds in 15 weeks by keeping track of my calories and how much I will spend working out through a calorie tracking app, my new runners group, and signing up for a 5K in 15 weeks. Now, while you may think that this goal is a little lofty, I can say that it is being done currently because this is actually my, my SMART goal. So feel free to copy it, uh, but I hope what you're able to see is that there's a difference between just a broad goal, which can be great, 
and how a SMART goal can really help you pursue it on a um, more achievable level. So if you are the type of nonprofit that works directly with people, uh, you're likely to always be looking for ways to market yourself. Now, as a nonprofit, you may not work with people as clients. You may be at a humane society or someone who is working to help our environment uh, to thrive. However, you still have donors, you still have staff, you still have volunteers. So pretty much all nonprofits work with people. Now, instead of repeating throughout the year that your team should really create some buzz on social media, maybe stop and pause. Take the time now to brainstorm and outline some campaigns that you'll be able to set up ahead of time. And then you can just click the button and hit go. Post. You can also think about how many, how people see you as an individual. What's the paradigm of your character? What would they say again if you asked them five words that described you best? You might be interested to learn how the perception of what you do can affect you and your organization and what you're aiming toward in the end, how you are on a mission. Now, permits, taxes, forms, IDs, licenses, whew, that can be pretty overwhelming, uh, which unfortunately leads to many organizations just putting it off. If you're serious about getting your organization organized, then take some time to update your files, your paperwork, so you just, you don't have that weight looming over you. Put it into a SMART goal. This is the paperwork that I need to do. Here's the time frame I'm going to do it, and here's how I know that I'm reaching success. For example, maybe you have a DBA doing a nonprofit as, doing a business as, but you know, nonprofits. Uh, so did you get your tax ID number, your EIN number? Are your licenses and permits updated and in order? Did you make any changes to your mission statements or your address or your bylaws and you need to fill, you need to file those changes? Have you reviewed your bylaws recently? At home, think about the future. Have you made a plan on when you're going to file your income taxes? And if your state doesn't have an income tax, you're still filing federal taxes. Well, let's think even deeply about what kind of loose ends we might have. Do you have an updated will? What about your retirement planning? Are you set up in a way that honors your dreams? These are really important questions for us to consider. The ones we don't usually like to think about, but the ones that are necessary for us to tackle. Now, every day, new technology becomes available to the public. So when was the last time you took some time just to take a look and see what's out there? Now, technology is here to help your workday less stressful. I was recently reading in Greg McCowan's um, Essential, no, not Essentialism, although that's a really good book by Greg McCowan, um, Effortless. And he says to use uh, those really high quality, high technology items for things that are absolutely essential, absolutely effective. And for those that just aren't as important, maybe not as crucial or needed for your organization, just go, just go low tech. It's okay, paper and pen, right? Um, so let's think about this in terms of your workday. Maybe you are needing to use a data computer software and that will cut down on some time. Maybe you need a chat system to quite frankly cut down on all those emails. Then you could go back to opening your email first thing in the morning. Maybe you need to update some programs that are outdated. Just take advantage of it, right? Let's, let's just explore our options. Now for me, it's hard not to be attracted to the shiny new object. So I have limited myself to using Trello to keep me organized, Evernote for all of my thoughts, especially when it comes to writing, and my calendar. It reminds me what I need to do. And once I have those three things, then I'm set. Uh, everything else is low tech. My grocery list is on the back of an envelope, right? My uh, daily to-do list is in my planner, which is right here. I use Michael Hyatt's full focus. Um, that is paper and pen. Uh, and again, you can see that it's really close to me too. Like keeping things close and handy when you need them is awesome. So where do you store your reminders? Are you using paper and pen? Do you need to shift to technology? Getting them out of your mind and either in some kind of digital place or in a paper base is the best way to keep on top of the things that are really important. And that's usually the person sitting right in front of you. Now you could consider just Flat out going paperless, that's totally fine. Studies have found that the average person wastes over 
four hours per week searching for papers. Ugh. If your office is still using filing cabinets, it's probably time to upgrade. Go through your drawers, your cabinets, shred anything that's out of date or no longer relevant for you or your nonprofit. Anything you want to keep, you can always scan it into the cloud, throw out the hard copy. Not only will this save you physical space, but it will also help you to quickly see what you need when you need it. Same goes for bill statements at home. The thank you letters you're never going to read again, notices that have come and gone. You know, I once did this process where I was like, you know, I just need this in a searchable place. So I'm going to go digital. And I went through all of the bill statements that I had. I went through all the papers that I had. I went through all the old schoolwork I had. I literally did it in one weekend. I went through all the papers in my house. And I didn't think I had a lot of paper, but I threw out three garbage bags of paper. Well, I recycled them, but I recycled three garbage bags of paper. I just didn't think I had that much. And in fact, I did. So I encourage you to consider doing the same. Now, speaking of searching for things, where do you keep your passwords? If you're like most of us, uh, one of two systems is what you tend to lean on. Either you use the same password for everything, or you try to make something up every time you get a new account and then forget it the next time you have to log back in. Now, the first one is in safe, second one's frustrating. So here's a third option, just find an app. Uh, I've heard of 1Password or LastPass. Uh, you can essentially think of them being a lockbox for all your passwords. They live on your desktop or your mobile device, and they're virtually impossible to hack. So it's a great way to keep that out of your mind so that you can focus on what's really important. Now, if you're someone who immediately feels their jaw clench every time they open their inbox, here's that inbox word again. Here's email. Let's reorganize. Begin by filing everything away that you no longer need to respond to or store them in some folder outside of your general inbox, maybe by year, maybe by a different category, by project or by person. Next, unsubscribe. Unsubscribe to emails that you have gotten in the habit of immediately deleting or sending them to your spam folder. Why even do that? Just unsubscribe. You can also create folders where non-essential email messages are sent into automatically so they don't interrupt your workflow or stress you out as much. I use this for invites that have been accepted or blogs I may want to read in the future when I need a little bit of inspiration, but not necessarily every time the author has something to say. So it's really easy for me, uh, as much as I in appreciate Inbox Zero, it was just really more of a stressor for me to do that. So I've created rules. I've made sure to unsubscribe to things that I'm not interested in. I've checked to see if maybe I can get a weekly digest rather than a daily digest. Now, with that mindset of Inbox Zero going away, it, it was actually uh, quite revealing to me when I realized that I don't have to respond to everybody in the first hour that they send me something. In fact, sometimes I'll wait 24 hours. Now I won't do that for donors or external people that I know are waiting on me for an answer. I do that for times where I see this as a fire that somebody's feeling, but I think it's gonna work out on its own. And so if it's a non-critical email, I will wait 24 hours. And oftentimes either the person finds their answer on themselves or the issue resolves itself with just a little bit of time. And I love the fact that people find their own answers because that means the next time the question comes around, they're gonna know where to go. I don't have to be the source of truth for everything. It's a great way to empower people in my, in my uh, viewpoint. Now, I've also seen people at the bottom of their email have a line that says something like, I'm responding at a time of day that works for me. I hope you understand and I expect you to respond in a time that's convenient for you. So it alleviates that pressure of having to respond right away or respond with a thanks, thanks, thanks. Now, some people enjoy that and that's totally cool. If that's your jam, do it. But if you are trying to tame your inbox, consider maybe that kind of a note to help people understand that you are doing what you can when you can. Now, while you're on the computer, visit your organization website, along with any other social media pages you have. Sift through every word on all of that stuff. If you have dead accounts, like, like an Instagram account that you haven't touched in five years, just deactivate it. 
it looks much worse to have an inactive account than no account at all. Now check your website for broken links, outdated contact information, old pictures, anything that would be confusing. While most of us consider a website for maybe donors or clients, you might also want to think through what does a prospective employee see in our website? What would a volunteer notice on our website? When I look for a job or a volunteer opportunity, quite frankly, the internet is where I start. I read their websites because I want to know more. So I think that there's some ways that you may want to fine tune, fine tooth comb your own website. Uh, and just think a little bit through what you are trying to show people and how the other various different constituents may notice your website and read through your website. Now, the last thing you want to do before you close that computer lid and give it a rest is to declutter your desktop and update your software. So check to see if you're running an old version of your internet browser, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, whatever you use. And if you are running something old, just update it. Empty your cache. That's a great thing to do from time to time too. Delete any old files, send them away to the cloud to fetch later if you really need them. This is your chance to clean up. You also will want to move on to cleaning up your office. So if you're in a communal office setting, then you can spruce things up a bit. Maybe add a few plants, maybe some art, and chat with your desk mates about rearranging some furniture. Toss out or put away any clutter that you don't use on a weekly basis. Now, if you have a personal office, create a better flow of energy by bringing things that you use consistently a little bit closer to you. Ditch the unnecessary clutter, bring in some new elements that make you feel happy and present. Now, like technology, the gadgets and tools we have at our disposal to work more efficiently, comfortably, aeronautically are always evolving. So by taking the time to update tools you use on a daily basis, you're considering what may make, make your life a little easier. Do you come home every night like, ah, my shoulder, right? Maybe you need a better office chair or maybe some sort of adjustment for your computer so that the top of your screen is at the same level as your eyebrows. Are you constantly shifting through a dozen open windows on your desktop? Like the tabs are so small that you can't click close? You know, maybe adding a second monitor or a computer screen could help you stay on track. A different browser window for different types of tasks that you need to do at your role. Maybe your eyes feel dry and itchy after eight hours. I know these days mine do. So invest in some uh, blue light blocking glasses. They have been wonderful during the days of the pandemic. And even afterwards, we all looking at our phones every day. Now, if a 20 year old were to walk into your supply closet and say, what's that? Oh, uh, it's probably a time to update your supply closet. Rolodexes, floppy disks, old phones, like corded phones, maybe ones that have a rotary dial on it, well, probably time to get rid of it. Giant computers, none of that stuff have a place in your organization or in your home. Find a way to dispose them or donate them. What is the next step you need to do to update your supply closet? Write it down. What is the very next step? Now, as you begin to get more into the groove of organizing your work life, get into the habit of making lists every morning and maybe one in the afternoon. As you go through your day, add to your list if you need to, and at the end of the day, cross off what you've done. And then you can create a fresh list for the morning to start with. Again, I use Trello for this one, and I also use my Michael Hyatt Full Focus Planner. Uh, the one that I use for Trello, I have a board for home, for writing projects, and for my business, and that's it. Uh, it helps me to keep focused on the three big MITs, my most important tasks. And uh, every time that I check off those three MITs, man, I'm feeling good. And everything else I get done that day, it's gravy. The rest is just gravy. Checklists are great too. I recently saw the video about power of habits, the cue, the action, and the reward, right? So anything that you can do to automate that process to make that action more habitual uh, is a great way to do that. So being consistent is oftentimes what I'm finding works well for me. 
So for instance, one of my three big MITs could be the same thing all year long. Exercise, right? That gets me closer to my SMART goal. Uh, I've also started to develop a consistent habit in the mornings. I do 30 minutes reading, 30 minutes writing, 30 minutes exercise, 30 minutes training on something that I want to grow in professionally, 30 minutes of uh, business or board responsibilities, 30 minutes of classwork. Well, and then I'm off to work, right? Those 30 minutes of each thing adds up a lot of time in a week. And by that, I mean, man, if I did 30 minutes of exercise every day, by the end of my work week, I've done three, two and a half hours. I've done two and a half hours of exercise. That is a whole lot easier to consume than two and a half like straight hours of exercise. That would be loony bin, right? So break it up into chunks, make those habits happen and making sure that of course that you have your cue, your action and your reward. And if you have a way of organizing those habits and making sure that you are doing some kind of a checklist system or something to keep you motivated, man, world's your oyster. You are gonna get there. Now, each Tuesday, I send out a two minute reflection on a lesson I've learned from the Bible and how it applies to nonprofit work. So as you can see on the slide, I posted a devotional on May 25th about habits. You might wanna check it out. You can go to mollybond.org and sign up to receive those in your inbox. Again, it's one email on Tuesdays. And if you're interested in personal leadership coaching at a rate that fits into your budget, so in other words, cheaper than the rest, uh, you can email me at molly at nonprofitsonamission.com. I oftentimes work with women who are struggling with work-life balance, who are not sure how to take the next step in their career, who are struggling just to find a way to manage all the stuff, to get organized, so if these tips have been useful for you and you want to personalize them and have somebody like just walk you through that process and make sure that you're doing it in a way that makes sense for you, let me know. You can always email me, molly at nonprofitsonamission.com. Now we're getting close to the end of our time together and we've covered a whole lot of information, right? If you're feeling overwhelmed, it's okay. It's okay. There are a lot of things that were presented tonight. Now remember this, you won't be able to complete all these tasks on your own. You're likely gonna to need to delegate, outsource, write it down in a checklist, right? The things that you want to accomplish. Uh, there's plenty of ways for you to start to take that next step. Something I recommend to all my clients is to build time into their schedules to catch up on organizational activities to stay organized. I do this myself once a week on Sundays. After the bulk of heavy lifting is done, try to make some time. Maybe for you, it's better on Friday than Sunday. Maybe two hours every other Monday. Some way to check in on your tasks and your goals to make sure that you are going along with what you wanted to do and that you're spending time keeping up with them. So for instance, I've scheduled 30 minutes every night to review the day, get ready for the next day. I reflect on what worked that day, what probably didn't work that day. It helps me to sleep better with all those things running through my mind, right? I just write it down on paper and get it organized. Getting Things Done by David Allen is an excellent resource on how to be more organized in order to free yourself and to free your mind, again, to focus on who is in front of you and what's really important in your life. So here's some of the resources that help to create this presentation for you. Um, and just know that this video is recorded and it will be put on YouTube later. So you can go back and take a closer look at anything that might have perked your interest. Now, that is all there is. We've made it to the end of our time together. So I'm happy that you had the opportunity to spend this time with me. I'm happy to be able to spend it with you. And I sincerely hope that you have gotten some helpful information about ways to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of your organization or yourself. Now, if you have questions that we didn't get a chance to address along the way, you can always put that in the comments, let me know, uh, or you can even leave a comment on what was the big takeaway that you want to try. Uh, just putting that next step down, just writing out one thing uh, will be useful, not only for me um, as feedback, but also for you. Don't write down, like, clean the house this weekend, right? Like maybe write down, go through that file cabinet that's been itching on my mind for a long time, right? Maybe just 
the first five folders. Make it small, make it achievable, make it easy. Now, the other thing uh, that I need to say about that's all there is, is that this is the last webinar in this series. Uh, so you are welcome to go back and look at the other webinars um, and learn from them. Uh, think through what has changed since you saw it the first time um, and consider maybe the ways that you may want to change things like your mission statement or how your core values have been working out. Or maybe even uh, six months from now, how would your organization, uh, how's your organization doing and how are you doing as a new organized person? So feel free to go back and watch them at any time. You'll always be able to find them by searching on YouTube Molly Bond, Nonprofits on a Mission, or Nonprofits on a Mission, Molly Bond. Either one will work. As long as you have the name of the business and my name in it, you will find them. So thank you so much again. I sure do appreciate your time, and I hope that you are finding yourself more organized. Go forth and stay on mission.